everybody. Welcome. Today we're at the Ninja Park. I'm here with the kids and also I'm here to talk about balance sheet and we'll talk about the cash flow statement as well. balance sheet. So quick overview, we're going to talk about usefulness, limitations of the balance sheet, the classifications on the balance sheet, and the general format. So that's what we're going to be covering within the balance sheet discussion. Let me catch my breath here for a second. So real quick, the examples that I'm using in this video are going to be te from Tesla's financial statements unless I state otherwise or unless it's otherwise clear. So there's a number of times when their name doesn't show up in the tables. So they are pulled primarily from Tesla's balance sheet. Those are the examples we'll be using as I walk through a lot of the different sections and show you how it's presented in a somewhat typical uh, public company. So first of all, the balance sheet, sometimes referred to as a statement of financial position, reports assets, liabilities, and equity as of a specific date. Um, it provides information about the resources and obligations and equity of the company, again, as of a specific date. The balance sheet does not provide us any information about the transactions. Or outflows. So it helps in predicting the amount, timing, and uncertainty of cash flows. In that sense, it's very similar to the income statement that we talked about before. The balance sheet just provides the balances as of a point in time, whereas the income statement is providing inflows and outflows and transactions, as we've talked about before. So some uses. Uh, balance sheet is used in computing rates of return, principally uh, return on assets. So the idea is that the assets of the company are reflected in the balance sheet. Those are the resources that the company has available to uh, earn additional money. So they have cash on hand, they have equipment, they have inventory that they use to then provide a uh, service or provide goods that allows them to earn some type of return. So this shows you what they have and what they're using. So return on assets is a, is a key metric that has been used for a long time. And that provides some information about what the company, what resources management has. In that sense, it's also used to evaluate the capital structure, like how much of the company is being financed with debt versus equity, in terms of how much of the resources are essentially claimed by creditors versus uh, residual that can be claimed by the equity investors. It allows investors to assess the risk of future cash flows. So also, it allows the investors and users of the financial statements to analyze the company's liquidity, which is how quickly items can, can will convert to cash. The solvency, which is getting back to uh, the capital structure, the solvency shows us how what kind of assets are available to cover the debts of the company. So will they run out of cash before they're able to cover their debts? That would make them insolvent, for instance. And then just this financial flexibility. Does the company have a lot of uh, cash or highly liquid resources that they're able to allocate to new and uh, potentially very profitable uh, ventures or new products or new services? Or are they relatively cash constrained and just being able to plug along doing what they've been doing for the time being? So those are some of the uses of the balance sheet. We move on to limitations. Um, first of all, same idea as like I've talked about limitations of the other financial statements. In general, we break this down into uh, accounting's uh, weaknesses in terms of identification, measurement, and communication, since that's kind of the goal of financial reporting. So if we start with identification, the balance sheet, similar to the income statement on the flow side, the balance sheet only captures identifiable, generally tangible, and financial assets. It excludes a lot of intangible assets unless they're somehow purchased by the company, in which case then we start to recognize them because there's a reliable measure of their value. But things like um, internally developed trademarks and uh, a lot of patent costs, uh, brand value, uh, those aren't captured in the balance sheet. So those are assets the company has and can utilize to make future returns, but the county doesn't capture them on the balance sheet. Also, a limitation, some identification, this could also be viewed as communication, is the balance sheet is a point in time presentation and excludes some transactions. So it doesn't capture transactions, it's just a point in time. And if you're doing, let's say a company engages in basically, it's just exchanging assets. Uh, it's not like a revenue transaction, it's not generating revenue per se, they're just uh, basically switching, say, cash for investments or some vice versa. Um, you don't see those, those movements 
in the balance sheet. All you get is as a point in time. And this became very evident and problematic during the financial crisis. Uh, largely, this was the accounting. Uh, this was the accounting manipulation that Lehman Brothers was doing in the sense that they had a bunch of high risk assets on their balance sheet for for almost the entire quarter. But then right at the end of the quarter, they sold these assets off of their balance sheet with the agreement to repurchase them at a later point in time. So they would sell them off, report their balance sheet to investors that show, oh, we're not holding these high risk assets. However, then whatever, a couple days after the end of the quarter, they would essentially exercise their right to buy them all back and they would buy them all back. So those assets were high risk, um, represented a risk to Lehman Brothers, then they were not captured in the balance sheet at all. Investors didn't know they even existed because of that transaction. So that point in time use of the balance sheet uh, in the sense that these transactions aren't being reported elsewhere unless they're essentially revenue as expenses, gains, or losses. And that can actually be used to deceive investors. Now, there's been a lot of accounting pronouncements that have come out in almost in response to that. Uh, regulatory financial statements for banks now, banks have to actually give the average uh, over average assets and liabilities over the over the period of time, not just at the end point in time. So they've been trying to compensate for some of those weaknesses. But that is still a limitation of the balance sheet. Measurement, again, we talked about historical cost and value and fair value. Historical cost does reduce the relevance um, in some sense of the balance sheet. Uh, with that said, it's not clear that most of the areas where historical cost is used that um, fair value would be any more relevant than historical cost. So we'll get to that as we talk through a lot more of the items in the balance sheet. But yes, historical cost does reduce some of the relevance of the balance sheet, depending on what you're trying to use the balance sheet to accomplish. And then there's the, those balances on the balance sheet do contain a lot of judgment. So we've talked about accounts receivable before. You estimate how much of that's going to be collected. Accounts receivable gets reported at net realizable value. So that's an estimate about how much you think you're going to receive on that. Inventory, similarly, how much are you going to be able to sell that inventory for? That's an, That requires some estimate, some judgment. That introduces or has the potential to introduce bias into the financial statements, particularly management's bias. And then lastly, communication. Uh, the balance sheet's not incredibly timely. It usually takes four to six weeks to be published, and that's even for a public company with a deadline. Private companies, it routinely takes three to four months to issue a balance sheet. So uh, this isn't exactly timely information. So some classifications. The elements of the balance sheet. These are elements straight out of the conceptual framework that we talked about uh, a number of weeks back. Um, our elements are assets, liabilities, and equity. And the definition of these items, this is important. You do need to start realizing or starting to know what these definitions are because as we get more and more into accounting, you start needing these definitions much more so. You can't just look at something and say, oh, well, that's clearly an asset. Uh, it gets a little bit fuzzy, particularly when you start dealing with what's liabilities versus equity. So an asset is the probable future economic benefit obtained or controlled by an entity as a result of past transactions or events. So just to dissect this a little bit. So it's a probable future economic benefit. It's not certain. It's just probable. That is why we're able to include accounts receivable on the balance sheet. It's probable that those will turn into cash. It's not certain. Some of them may not. We try to estimate those, but it is probable that we will get an economic benefit, i.e. we will receive cash at some period of time. Now, that those accounts receivable, to the extent that the company is the one who controls them and has the right to collect them, they are an asset to the company. And this has to be as a result of past transactions or events. Now, those accounts receivable are receivable because they performed a service or sold a good in the past. Now, if you have an account receivable or something you haven't done, that's not an asset yet because it's not that account receivable is not the result of a past transaction or event. Uh, it's, it could be the result of something you can do in the future. So pre-billing, pre-billings do not equate to assets generally. Opposite with the introduction of another party here. So, a liability is the problem of future economic sacrifice of economic benefits. So, if assets are benefits, liability is the sacrifice of those benefits. Again, they have to be arising from present obligations. This can't be something that we'll potentially be obligated to in the future. This is what prevents us from recording, say, uncertain liabilities or this idea that, well, um, I, have, I have a factory on the coast that can get hurt by a hurricane. I don't record a liability. Um, until I get actually hit by the hurricane and it incurs costs and expenses. It's not just like, oh, this could happen and therefore I'm going to have a liability for it. Uh, that's not allowed because it's not a present obligation and it's not the result of past transactions or events. You can't have a liability for something you expect to maybe happen in the future. So that's critical. 
one spot where that gets a little bit squishy is say say a litigation. So you've been sued as a company, and you have there's a chance you might have to pay um, damages in, in, as part of the litigation. Now the question is, okay, well, is there a present obligation? Well, um, maybe. You don't know because the case hasn't finalized yet. And the question is then, okay, is it the result of a past transaction or event? Well, yeah, because, well, somewhat because the litigation is regarding something you did in the past. So if there is a liability or if there is a cost that will come out of this litigation, it's because of the past transaction that I we, we did something wrong or the company did something wrong. But um, that hasn't been settled yet. So litigations, they're called un basically uncertain and there's a whole literature on that. We're not going to get into it. We're talking about just so That's the liabilities. Lastly, we have equity. Equity is the residual interest in the assets of an entity that remain after deducting its liabilities. So, equity is the residual. By definition, equity is assets minus liabilities it gives you equity because that's the residual that is what's left over for the equity stockholders or the equity interest in the company. So, those are the elements. Drilling into the but long-term investments as well. Property, plant, and equipment is always going to be a long-term asset. Intangible assets and other assets. Typically, assets and liabilities are listed in order of liquidity. Uh, and that's why we start with current. That's why when you look at a balance sheet, cash is essentially always first, and then it's followed by a receivable inventory and so forth with the idea of like, okay, well, cash is already cash. and then usually becomes accounts receivable and then we collect it so it keeps going through the process. So that's the ordering and those are the assets. Within the liabilities and equity section, we just we break out liabilities into current and long-term uh, liabilities as well. And then stockholders equity, we just list all the stockholders equity accounts. Again, if there's preferred stock, which is usually uh, close or almost like it's a little bit like a debt instrument, there's been a lot of debate about that in the past, but preferred stock is usually listed first and then uh, accumulated other companies make them listed last. So that's the general classification. So if we drill into current assets, so current assets, we have cash and other assets the company expects to convert into cash, sell or consume within one year or in the operating cycle, whichever is longer. So most companies, their operating cycle is less than a year. If we took a company like, say, Walmart or even Tesla, their operating cycle is they buy inventory, so cash goes out in the form of purchasing inventory or purchasing uh, materials to construct a car or Tesla. They then they then build the car and they sell the car. So that whole operating cycle, even for a company like Tesla that has to build a car, is still probably only a couple months long. Walmart's operating cycle is probably like 30 or 60 days. It's very short. And that's, well, that's one of the things that's made Walmart so successful is that basically their management of their supply chain is frankly, it's phenomenal in how quickly they turn things over. So those, that's why, that is how we define current assets. Now, there are companies and industries that function with an operating cycle that extends beyond a year. If you're building, let's say, a skyscraper, for instance, or a, a large ship, these are some classic examples. Now, by the, from the time you start expending money to build a, a large building, say you start or you even start with the permitting process. Right? So that could take years to complete from the time you start the permitting process, you acquire the land, start the permitting process through the time when you actually sell the units that you're building, or the ship that you're building. That could be years. Well, if, it's, if the operating cycle is years long, then current assets are anything in the operating cycle. So these are those type of assets are typically referred to as operating assets. And they're distinguished from, say, property, plant, and equipment, and other long-term assets. So current assets are assets the company expects to convert into cash or sell or consume within one year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. So they're typically presented on the balance sheet in the order of liquidity, as we talked about before. In terms of basis of measurement, getting back to how we measure things when we talked about the conceptual framework, cash and cash equivalents are measured fair value. Pretty straightforward cash and cash equivalents generally are pretty close to the Short-term investments 
generally fair value. Receivables are valued at the net realizable value. That's the amount the company expects to collect um, from those receivables. Inventory is the lower of cost or net realizable value. So you can't purchase inventory with the idea that, of, of your, that you're going to sell it for more and write it up as soon as you buy it. <laughs> um, so it's held at cost, which is your the amount you have invested in the inventory. Um, or if you aren't able to sell it for what you bought it for, you write it down in that case. So that inventory is the lower of cost, your net advisable value. And then prepaid expenses are cost minus the basically the used up portion of the expense. That ends up with prepaid expenses. So that's that's how we, uh, that's, that's the valuation of most of the current assets. So we just drill into cash a little bit. Now we will have an entire section where we talk about cash at some point in the future. But right now, just real quickly, cash, generally these are all monies available on demand. Now within cash, most companies report cash and cash equivalents. Cash equivalents aren't cash on demand or money on demand. They are short-term, highly liquid investments that mature within three months or less. That's critical. It has to basically automatically convert into cash within three months. So there's potentially, you could have something that's not available on demand, but it's considered, that would be considered a cash equivalent, assuming it converts to cash automatically within three months. Uh, that's how, that's the definition of cash, cash equivalents. Those are reported first under current assets on the balance sheet. If there are restrictions or there is somehow restricted cash, that has to be disclosed separately. And those cannot be put into cash and cash equivalents because again, they're not available on demand and they won't necessarily convert to usable cash for the company within three months. So, um, for instance, Tesla, in their notes, they break out kind of all of their cash flows. Um, if you looked at their balance sheet, they would just list cash and cash equivalents, and then they would have a current and a long-term portion of restricted cash. And that's how they would report it. So Tesla has whatever, I think, two or you know, six, um, six billion dollars worth of cash sitting on its balance sheet, cash cash equivalents sitting on its balance sheet. And then whatever, 200, like 200, roughly 250 um, restricted in short and another 250 in long. So they have what, $500 million of uh, restricted cash that they have to, again, report separately. So once we were, moving on from cash, we have short-term investments. These are short-term investments, equity securities and debt securities. Equity securities under current gap are fair valued with all changes going flowing through the income statement or flowing through net income. That's critical as opposed to flowing through other comprehensive income. Now, debt securities, you can have three groups of debt securities. You can have held to maturity, which means the company has the intent and ability to hold these until they mature. Uh, in general, held to maturity, you're not recognizing the change in the valuation because you're going to hold it. So you're going to make whatever interest rate it's paying, you're going to make that until it matures. Um, you're not concerned that, well, if, uh, interest rates went up, so the value of my held to maturity, held to maturity debt instruments goes down. You don't have to worry about those valuation changes. You can have trading debt securities. These are going to, these are buying and selling with, with the idea of generating income on short-term price differences or price fluctuations. These, uh, the valuation changes in these go to net income. And then availables for sale is debt securities not classified as held to, mature, held to maturity or trading securities. Typically, the valuation changes of held available for sale debt securities are going to flow through other comprehensive income. So it's not like we're trying to uh, time the market uh, or time interest rates. In this case, we, we're just uh, not necessarily plan to hold these to maturity, which is important when, when some maturities are whatever, 30 years out. So those are available for sale. It does, the fluctuations in value does not typically hit the income statement, but it does go through other comprehensive income. So moving on to receivables, our next current asset. So receivables are claims held against customers and others for monies, goods, and services. So some major categories of receivables are typically shown, and they basically have to be shown on the balance sheet or in the notes. So the big two classifications are either trade and non-trade. Most companies just report trade and non-trade. If there's a big block of non-trade, that's going to, they will disclose exactly what the non-trade receivables are, uh, if nothing else in discussions in the, in the notes, they'll talk about what non-trade is. Um, and the company needs to specifically or clearly identify um, what their allowance is for doubtful accounts, so how much of those receivables they expect to not receive, um, the amount and nature of any non-trade receivables, and if they're using their receivables as collateral for a loan, which is very common, receivables often back up, back up uh, operational loans, so lines of credit that companies borrow, which is kind of like a company credit card. 
So if receivables are used as that, they have to be disclosed. And that's a general process. Most companies disclose all of their assets that are that are serving as collateral for their for their loans, and that's best practice uh, and sometimes often required. Moving on from receivables, we have inventory and prepaid expenses. So inventory are assets the company holds for sale in the normal course of business. It discloses this based on valuation method is lower cost or net realizable value, as I talked about before. And then the cost has to also mention the cost flow assumption. This the cost flow assumption is whether you're looking at LIPO, FIPO, weighted average cost, or specific identification, stuff that you should have talked about or should be familiar with at this point in your accounting career, but we will have an entire chapter where we deal with inventory and you get a chance to work through it somewhat. And then lastly, we have prepaid expenses. These are usually listed last because they actually don't convert to cash, they get used up in the normal course of business. So prepaid expenses are uh, listed as to be our last current asset. So real quick, I'll pop up Tesla's uh, balance sheet and this is all of their assets listed. We just walked through their current, a lot of the current assets. So they have cash, cash equivalents, restricted cash, um, accounts receivable, inventory, and prepaids, and then some other stuff that they've tossed in there before we get to um, other current uh, or total current assets. Moving on to long-term assets. So we'll start with long-term investments. So long-term investments can be any number of things. They can be securities, which are just stock, common stock, bonds, long-term notes. They can be tangible fixed assets the company's not planning on using in the operations. That would be an investment as opposed to property, plant, and equipment. There can be special funds, so pensions, uh, sinking funds, plant expansion funds, essentially highlighting that we have this block of investments or securities that we're holding for a very specific purpose. That's good information for them to disclose to their investors. And then non-consolidated subsidiaries or affiliated companies, so basically what we would call equity investments that are more than just a security. Uh, it actually represents a little bit more ownership in a company than a security typically would. So those are our long-term investments. Next, we'll move on to property, plant, and equipment. These are physical properties, so tangible, long-lived assets used in the regular operations of the business. Physical properties such as land, buildings, machinery, furniture, tools, all this stuff is usually categorized within property, plant, and equipment. This gets depreciated, so the company has to disclose accumulated depreciation, which reduces the value, which is historical cost, of those items that were purchased. And with the exception of land, the company either it depreciates it, buildings, or depletes it if it's natural resources. So if we were to look at Tesla, for instance, we have their property, plant, and equipment. They have machinery, equipment, vehicles, and office furniture. They have tooling, leasehold improvements, land and buildings, all the computer equipment, and then construction in progress means this is these are items that they are building but have not yet started to use up. So construction in process is not yet depreciated because they haven't started to use it up. So that's why it's usually highlighted there. And then they list all the accumulated depreciation with their net uh, net property plant equipment, and that's the amount that ends up on the balance sheet. So moving on from tangible property to intangibles, we have intangible assets. So these are assets that lack physical substance and they're not financial instruments. Financial instruments get recorded as investments. Intangible assets, they lack physical substance. So some of the examples of this, we have a lot of times you'll see tri uh, trademarks, copyrights, um, goodwill, although that's usually listed separately. Um, in process research and development, all of these things get put in there. A lot of times they only get valued if they are purchased. There are some exceptions for when you can start capitalizing costs associated with patents, but most of this stuff you don't get to recognize any value for unless you purchase it. So if we were to look at Tesla, they have intangible assets, they have say developed technology. So developed technology represents, well, technology they get to use, it has some value, they're depreciating it over its useful life. Um, and then they have the net carrying value, which is the how much that's sitting on the balance sheet for. So if you notice, so if you look at the table for Tesla, we have the gross carrying amount. Then there's the amortization. So accumulated amortization is just like accumulated depreciation. And then other. So other is generally very small. The biggest other point for Tesla is they actually impaired their in-process research and development. That's IPR and D. So they're in process research and development. They realize that they are not going to continue that project. So they actually uh, it impaired that. And then it basically wrote that in process research and development off. They're no longer recording that as an asset on their balance sheet. 
moving on just a the last couple last assets so other assets is kind of the end it can be any number of things whatever other assets the company holds it's just going to list a lot of times is long-term prepaid expenses non-current receivables assets and special funds deferred income taxes property held for sale restricted cash or securities any number of things there's really no limit to what can go into other but if you have other assets that don't fall into a main category you can put them here and list them or you can just have a category that says other assets which is what most companies have because there's no individual one of these items that's significant in and of itself if we move on to liabilities so liabilities are probable future sacrifices of economic benefit arising from present obligations of a particular entity to transfer assets or provide services to other entities in the future as a result of past transactions or events that's our definition that we talked about before these are generally broken down into current and long-term liabilities just like we do with assets Current liabilities, some examples, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go through a ton of these in detail. We have accounts payable, accrued liabilities, and other, we have deferred revenue, um, any, any other number of things. Those are the main current liabilities that most companies report, and Tesla reports most of those as well. Long-term liabilities are typically going to be long-term debt, or some type of other long-term deferred revenue, or say Tesla has resale value guarantees, which means they have a liability associated with a guaranteed future value of their cars actually they provided a, a ability for a subset of their customers to resell their cars to Tesla at a cert, at a fixed price in the future that's a liability to Tesla um, if they have to buy those for less than they're actually worth so that is recorded as a liability for Tesla moving on to stockholders equity our common stockholder equity areas that we have talked about we talked about last time we talked about the equity statement we have Capital stock, that's the par stated value of the shares issued. Additional paid in capital, which is everything else, all the other cash received when you sold the shares. Retained earnings are exactly that. They're the earnings the company has retained or the earnings they have not yet paid out. Uh, the accumulated other comprehensive income is the aggregate amount of other comprehensive income items over time. So whatever, just like retained earnings captures all the earnings, accumulated other comprehensive income captures all of the other comprehensive income items and it just accumulates over time. Do you have treasury stock uh, if the company bought its own stock? Those are, those are listed separately as treasury stock, generally at the cost of the shares repurchased. We also have non-controlling interests. These are minority interests. We spent a lot of time talking about these, I think in like the last video or the video before that. So I'm not gonna dive into what non-controlling interests are. Those are a portion of equity and subsidiaries that are not wholly owned by the reporting company. So Tesla lists out all of theirs. For just some example, if you note, um, they have some preferred stock, but it's not big enough to even make it on the balance sheet. Also, common stock actually has zero value because by the time uh, it's like whatever, I think it's a tenth of a sh a tenth of a cent for each share, and they have roughly two billion shares outstanding. It doesn't even come in; doesn't even hit one one million dollars. So, and then you have additional paying capital, which is the big number. Accumulated other comp uh, accumulated other comprehensive income. Uh, accumulated deficit, those are that's like retained earnings, but if you've all, always lost money or you've lost more than you've made, you don't have earnings, you have accumulated deficit. Um, and then that gives them the total stockholders' equity. Real quickly, moving on to balance sheet disclosures. Um, so, note disclosures. Uh, finance, companies report a lot of disclosures in their notes. Their notes are very informative. If you start reading through a company's notes, you learn a lot about what they're doing as a company and how they account for things and why certain things are moving. It's important to look at the notes. So things that are disclosed in the notes, the accounting policies, uh, any contractual situations, contingencies, like we said, some contingencies don't make it onto the balance sheet because they they don't meet the criteria. Those still have to, a lot of times, have to get disclosed in the notes of the financial statements. Those contingencies could be huge. They just aren't certain or haven't met the threshold at which point we think they're probable, which would make them ask their liability based on the definitions, if you remember. And then a lot of times there's a lot of fair value information also disclosed in the notes of the financial statements. Techniques and disclosures, we just talked about them putting it to notes. You can put parenthetical explanations, which is just putting something in parentheses. Like uh, a lot of times you'll see this on a balance sheet where they report accounts receivable and then in parentheses they'll say net of uh, estimated bad debt expense of or estimated allowance for Apple accounts of, that'll be in parentheses, so those are parenthetical explanations. I looked over Tesla, they have none, and also Walmart didn't have any obvious ones either, so I don't have a great example for that. You can cross-reference, which is just say, you said something like other assets, uh, other long-term assets, and then you would say 
Note 15, which means go look at Note 15. We provide a lot more information about that. Supporting schedules, a lot of times are included in the fine statements. And then just general terminology. What do they mean when they say different things or when they talk about restricted? What does that really mean? The restricted means different things for different companies. So that's kind of critical uh, information to have. With that, that wraps up our discussion of the balance sheet. Hopefully you are somewhat familiar with the balance sheet even before we started talking about it today. And this just kind of highlight, uh, refreshed your memory, uh, helped fill in a couple of the gaps. In the next video, we're going to talk about the statement of cash flows. I probably will not be doing that from this Ninja Park, but maybe we will head back to the house, set up some Ninja stuff there, let the kids play on that, and uh, I'll come back and finish up with uh, finish up this whole section with the statement of cash flows. So with that, have a great day and God bless.